All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, wanted just to let you know that we are recording this call and you all are muted right now. But if you do want to ask questions, just unmute yourself or use the chat box. Um, and I also want to hand this over to Jim Kirianis, who is my co-host today. So Jim, do you have your, your unmute button handy? I do, I'm unmuted. So if you can hear me, we'll get started. Yep, you sound great. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Benedict Rydell. Uh, he's the Global Computing Coordinator for the IceCube Neutrino Observatory, as well as Computing Manager uh, for the Wisconsin IceCube uh, Particle Astrophysics Center. And um, he's also previously worked at the Open Science Grid at the University of Chicago, and he received his doctorate in 2014 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, working on supernova neutrino signals at the IceCube uh, Observatory itself. And um, so last uh, last month, we had uh, Frank and Igor talk, talk a little bit about the computing side of um, the cloud computing environment in support of IceCube. And we thought this month we might do a little bit of a counterpoint where we talk a bit about more about the researcher uh, perspective and the research perspective on the uh, IceCube project and the benefits and uh, its evolution uh, of adopting community-based uh, computing resources. And um, with that, I'd like to thank Benedict for joining us and hand it over to him to start the presentation. So can everybody see the presentation and hear me? <laughs> we hear yeah. you and we, yeah, and your presentation too. Looks great. Right. Thanks. So, um, <clears throat> Hopefully you can see the slide. It's uh, so, so, so as a summary, we start out kind of with the, again, what IceCube is and uh, what, how we built it and why we built it there. So IceCube is a neutrino observatory that is base, basic, is based at the South Pole. It focuses on high energy astrophysical neutrinos, such as those, um, sort of the highest energy um, neutrinos that we detect from outer space. Uh, it was built between about 2016 and 2010 and in, in stages because of the uh, environment. So we can only build in the summer. Uh, we can only con do construction in the, in, the, in the austral summer. And what we basically did was we deployed very sensitive light sensor, uh, light detectors into the uh, South Polar ice cap. So the South Polar Ice Cap is about uh, two miles deep, or high rather, and then we drilled holes into that ice cap using um, hot water and deployed these detectors uh, between 1450 meters and 2450 meters in, this, uh, in the ice cap. And so overall we get a, a cubic kilometer of instrumented detector, uh, and hence the name Ice Cube then. So IceCube science, uh, so it's, it's a very broad uh, science goal here. It's a very fairly novel instrument, just from the sort of, you know, goals and the, the breadth of what it can do. So we, we, we span sort of science astrophysics and neutrino physics. We also do earth sciences in forms of glaciology and earth tomography. Then we also do indirect dark, dark matter searches. We look for beyond the standard model particles. This includes dark matter. And then uh, we also do fundamental symmetry. So Lorentz, Lorentz invariance and things like that. But sort of the, the two main, uh, you know, our bread and butter is neutrino astrophysics or multimeter astronomy at this point, And neutrino physics is sort of our, 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 our big other uh, source of, uh, you know, uh, notable publication. So, but this, this, this sort of brings us to uh, sort of to a crossroads in that, you know, we have all this data that needs to be processed in very different ways for very different analyses. So, um, uh, as you might, as you might know, you know, neutrino oscillations is is anywhere in the GeV territory. So it's 10 to the six electron volts and energy and the astrophysics sort of starts around uh, 
the TeV and above, so we we actually detect particles up to the PeV at this point. So we have sort of a, this this large massive energy range that we need to cover, and that means we have sort of also lots of simulation to do of these various different effects, but then also their respective backgrounds. So that's that's a, a big part of what we do at this this point in computing, is the processing and then the simulation. Uh, so just to give a thirty thousand foot view of this, uh, so. It's it's realistically sort of classical particle physics computing. It's ingeniously parallelizable, so grid computing. We have these event, what we call events, or rather a time period of interest. Something interesting happened, and we call it an event. <clears throat> and then, kind of between the events, the number of detectors that are that are participating in that event are uh, varies. And ideally, you would sort of parallelize this on the per event basis, meaning you know every time period is independent of another. And meaning that you know, uh, a priori, you know, you can say, you know, at, at our current rate, every single individual event is distinct from the previous one to first order. So that means we we could technically parallelize on that and and sort of distribute that data out. Um, <clears throat> there are several caveats, though. So we have no direct and continuous network link to the experiment. So um, everything has to go via satellite. That means um, we, we have, for most most period of the day, we have a very limited bandwidth to the experiment. That means you know we're, we're all on the order on the order of sort of kilobytes a second, if even that. Uh, so you type in your password, you walk away, and you hope that you've logged in, kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> Then the other part is, you know, we, we're operating in extreme conditions. That is, you know, 40, minus 40 degrees C or minus 40 F is considered sort of a warm day. Um, it is technically a desert. Um, it's, at, it's also at altitude, so this is roughly 11,000 feet, give or take. That means, you know, we're, we're, we're operating a, a detector, but then also the infrastructure for the detector at extreme environments. Uh, our simulation requires specialized hardware, so we were one of some of the first people that uh, really were utilizing GPUs extensively in our simulation. And then, of course, you know, we all to consider all this. We have this in-house development of specialized software to sort of uh, accommodate these sort of non-standard or rather sort of non-particle physics uh pieces in in our workflow to so the large energy range but then also the specialized hardware so in this large energy range also brings some other uh difficulties with it so we so there's a resource prediction uh it is sort of a, a big topic for us the runtime of each of each uh, simulation is also a big topic so this is kind of a a very big sort of question about how to schedule eff efficiently and effectively onto these sort of distributed resources that we have today, and that kind of you know keeps uh, keeps us up at night in, in, in that respect. So well, let's let's take a step back and, and, and look at the beginning a, l a little bit. So um, the focus was really high energy astrophysical neutrinos. That means you know you, technically you can make very harsh uh, you, you can do a very simple, what the physicists call cut and count. So you do very harsh data reduction, and then um, you basically have very little data that you actually look at that is actually interesting. And um, basically, you know, to first order, that's how you build your requirements. You say, you know, oh, I assume that you know, I, I will, my analysis will make these and these assumptions, and this is my focus. Therefore, I can, you know, scale it to the scale it to uh, to this this data rate. Um, and and kind of the initial requirements were set in set with that in mind. That you know we have this sort of singular focus, and then we we build out from there. It's also because the sector was built in stages, so the the in cyber infrastructure had to grow with that in mind. So we. Over over time, over the construction of the experiment over these five to six years, we we built out the the cyber infrastructure. And then you know the the, the real thing was that the discovery was really you know anywhere from five to ten years depending on on you know what we actually found in in, in that. So we, we were sort of in the blind in some ways. 
and and that sort of also was the focus for the first five to ten years. It was limits, or rather, you know, setting limits and figuring out, you know, where in that five to ten year period uh, we would have a discovery. Another thing, you know, as I said, with with, with this, net, this limited network link, the the computing at pole was really the focus. So really, you know, getting the data from the raw data rate down to a manageable data stream that can fit on the satellite was really sort of a, a, a somewhat a, a very strong focus in that sense that you know we need to deploy this 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 computing infrastructure in a harsh environment but then also you know how do we get to 10 percent of the data rate that we are that we are looking at and then for this sort of the design was sort of a central data analysis facility where we had HTC cluster, data warehouse, sort of the, the standard data set the infrastructure around it. So, you know, the websites, the email servers, the wiki pages, et cetera. And it was sort of self-hosted everything because, I mean, that was 2004, 2005. That was sort of the decision that was made because those, there weren't very good alternatives at the time. Uh, and then sort of the, the local resources. So, I mean, we, we are a lot of uh, distributed collaboration. But really, what, what it was, the local resources were for local analysis and local person's responsibility. That means, you know, if you wanted to use your local resources, it was up to you to figure out how A, to install the software, B, how to get the data there, and sort of C, how to, um, <clears throat> how to run on those resources. So there wasn't any sort of uh, thought about distributed computing and uh, how that would affect us. So sort of as a cartoon here, it's the, the beginnings in, in, in sort of data, in, in, in the data world is a neutrino comes in from, from our sources, interacts in a detector. We have two sets of data. One is this sort of what I mentioned at this, this reduced data that comes over satellite. And then once a year, we basically get a set of tapes back uh, from the South Pole that have all the raw data on it. So we, we get a snapshot it's sort of daily, and then we get everything uh, once a year. It has to be shipped via, it has to be shipped uh, via uh, over the ocean, and then of course via uh, just normal FedEx, UPS. So basically, you know, high high throughput, low uh, high high latency transfer. <clears throat> so now we come sort of the middle years, which is kind of the period you know the detector has just been completed. We're in sort of our first uh, first years of complete data taking. And actually, with the five to three years, we act, uh, five to ten years, we actually did it in three. So we discovered the high energy astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, <clears throat> and, but also, we are adding scope at this point. So we're adding science where we're realizing that, you know, this, this thought about, you know, can we do neutrino oscillations? Can we do dark matter? Actually, we, we, uh, we can, uh, but there are several caveats. <clears throat> Uh, that, you know, now that we're doing this sort of precision science or trying to do this precision science, uh, our systematic effects becoming much more uh, uh, important. So this is the optical model of the ISO. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later, what exactly that means. But, you know, how the light that is, is generated by, by, neut by neutrinos or rather by neutrino interactions in the ice uh, travels through the ice, then of course our simulation needs were underestimated because we're adding the scope. Um, and, and, and through that, of course, we, we the first thing is, you know, we're at UW-Madison, so the first initial thought is grid computing is sort of our solution here. Um, it, it became sort of a, a thing mostly for production workloads that, you know, what we call sort of simulation production, so the standardized simulation data sets that we produce. But then also we had a few expert users that basically you know could use this. But for the you know run of the mill grad student or run of the mill postdoc, it was kind of this ominous uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, we went out to you know our, our our friends at CHTC at UW Madison, so CHTC and the HD Condor Group and the OSG Group there. Um, for, for resources, but then also we, we reached out to our, our other collaborators at DAISY sort of to, to, to sort of build a first grid infrastructure. So basically, 
first of all, have access to OSG, but then also use the OSG infrastructure to submit jobs to, in this case, Europe. Um, and, and, and there was sort of this, 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 this thought of, you know, this is all very much homebrew. We're the only ones doing this. This is the frontier kind of thing rather than, you know, there's somebody out there that does something very similar. So, so the sort of very much sort of this particle physics uh, aspect of computing, sort of we're the first ones and we have to, you know, uh, we're, we're becoming sort of out of the primordial soup there. Uh, <clears throat> so, so we, we made many, many sort of improvements to our software in terms of, you know, doing these high precision studies, but then also this, this need for the optical model brought us to more and more complications. So around 2011, 2012, we started with our, uh, GPU efforts. So, uh, this meant, you know, understanding how to run GPUs in a data center, but, you know, also GPUs in in an office. Like, I mean, we literally uh, had a few GPUs go up in flames <laughs> um, because, you know, we didn't understand what we were doing in, in many ways. So, for example, the power footprint, the cooling footprint, all those things were sort of, you know, untested territory at that point. But we were also able to, you know, with that, the, reduce our memory footprint drastically by kind of a factor three, uh, which, you know, is good, but then, you know, it, it's sort of like you, you, you're making trade-offs here. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, more science means more specialized software, sort of this bifurcation in, in terms of, you know, this set of software is for the, the high energy astrophysics folks, this set of software is for the neutrino oscillation folks, this set of software comes from the dark matter folks, et cetera, et cetera, and all these sort of various packages and dependencies that come in with that so um, that we needed to support at that point. So we also made sort of a, a you know, the, this diagram looks fairly similar, but we made a sort of drastic change in moving from tape to disk. For our raw data, this is mostly because we realized after running tape for a few years, Tape is very bad in a in a low uh, humidity environment like the South Pole, so we had more and more issues with the tape and the disk. And disks were basically the the, the alternative there. So we started instead of shipping uh, tapes, we started shipping disks. <clears throat> so so going into a little bit more to the sort of details here of, of, of what's happening. So. Um, the ICE model is sort of the uh, one of our biggest, or was one of our biggest issues, which basically uh, boils down to, you know, IceCube is built into a natural medium. That means a priori we can't calibrate it properly. Like we can't just build another detector, calibrate it, take it all back out, and build build IceCube kind of thing. Uh, so, so what you can see is here is you know as a function of sort of depth and and wavelength of light that the that the ice has a pattern in its sort of layers of, of optical transparency. But what we realize is is that this is sort of uh, just it's very first order. Let me put it this way. So, so on top of this comes things like the cable shadow. So every detector has sort of a cable running next to it for power and data transfer. And the question is, you know, how much of our detectors is obfuscated by that, but then also the construction of the detector changed the properties of the ice close to our detector. So you can see here in this whole ice image, you have you have photons that are traveling, or the various different lines are photons traveling, and then suddenly you see that, um, you know, outside of this column, they travel very in, in very in fairly in fairly long straight lines, and they don't do don't have a lot of scattering. But as soon as they get into this column, the scattering becomes a, an, a very important effect. So the, the fusion of light is is much stronger. And then also over the years, we have now realized that there's even more effects. So we have what we call tilt or uh, tilt, meaning that you know the as as the ice moves across the it's a glacier, so it moves across the continent. It, it, it the patterns in the ice are changing, or the pat, or the, rather the, the the bedrock it's moving over is changing. So that is causing uh, changes, sort of tilt in the layers that we we see before. And then also because this is like 
a, basically a river flowing through, you have preferential directions in your in your model that you know there is a preferential direction in terms of uh, you know optical clarity, um, which is you know something we didn't even think about at that point. We thought it was sort of a literally an ice cube. And the issue really is what issue really boils down to is that these effects uh, for our directional reconstruction, so especially for astronomy, have a very drastic effect. So this is basically saying like you know instead of pointing, you know, straight ahead, you point 30 to 40 degrees to the side and uh, between these various models. So you, and that's just the the optical model of the eye. So it, it heavily affects our, 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 our pointing direction for certain events. So the solution we came up with is basically that we have ray tracing with GPUs, which is sort of a, a, a very brute force approach to, to solving the problem. So we wait, so we quote unquote waste a lot of uh, time but we're able to parameter, but we're able to put in all these physical details that are way too complex to parameterize individually. So basically, we can parameterize them individually, but you know, putting this this entire package together is is much too complex um, to do. Uh, and, and you know, as I mentioned, you know, we dropped this detector in sort of a gray box. You know, it's very clear, but you know, is it uniform? Has the how has the construction changed, et cetera, et cetera. And all these things, you know, are important, have, have turned out to be important in one way or another for some analyses. So for high energy analyses, so for, for sort of events in the TEV and above range, it, it, the, it makes an effect, it, it has an effect, but uh, it's not that dramatic compared to, let's say, neutrino oscillation analysis where these effects are a, a dominant um, issue or need to be addressed. <clears throat> so just to sort of uh, go a little bit into this, what's this in terms of flow? Uh, one, of, one of the issues is, of course, so here's an example event. This is a cartoon saying, you know, if you have an event that is sort of isotropic in its emission, but then you have a medium that is inisotropic in its uh, kind of properties, you will see these uh, weird sort of poles in, in certain directions. So sort of an anisotropic event becomes an, uh, an anisotropic event. But the issue then comes is every time we make these improvements to the, the models or our simulations, the sort of the old simulation becomes less attractive to a lot of people. So the question is, do we just chuck it all out, redo all our simulation, or uh, <clears throat> Or you know, how do we address this sort of issue that every time we learn more about our detector, uh, we need to basically you know re-simulate everything, and people and, and analyzers want to basically have this um, the most up-to-date information, but also the most up-to-date simulation. So if you imagine that you know we run for more and more time, therefore we need more simulation to keep up with with the lifetime, but then also every you know two to three years, we basically <clears throat> change our understanding of the detector and could potentially re-simulate everything uh, to have the best fidelity. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of a, 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 a sort of path we're still walking at the moment, like trying to figure out how to exactly not waste, quote unquote, waste the resources over time. So this is a, a, a little bit of a cartoon showing how this exactly works out. So this is actually a, a this is a this is a particle traveling through a detector and, and emitting light. Uh, and you, as you can see, as you know, this is only about uh, a thousandth of the number of photons that are actually produced. So you can see how the light travels through the detector as a part along the path of the uh, emission here. So, but you can also see that you know this light is, has sort of uh, expands a lot. So the the this is roughly about a 300 meter cone, or rather, um, that's traveling through the detector. So that's a lot of distance, but then also a lot of photons that we basically have to simulate and in, in a very sort of wasteful way. <clears throat> so, um, so why do we do simulation? The physics is really the issue here. We have lots of background and lots of possible physics. So 
Um, in, in this case, you know, we we are now in the in sort of the precision science range. That means you know we have tuned our detector fairly well, uh, but we also want to do all of the science. And in that case, you know, we have three kilohertz of, of, of rate across ten plus orders of magnitude in energy, and we run you know ninety plus percent uptime for eight uh, years now. Or yeah, oh, let's it's actually nine now. <clears throat> And for every, uh, and for every, you know, ideally in the ideal case, we would want ten times the simulation that we have actual data. That means, you know, we would have to simulate eight, 80 years of, of simulation. The issue is, is though, for every year of lifetime in certain bins, uh, we need 500 years of compute time. To actually achieve that, so we have sort of this this weird forty thousand years of compute time that we need to, or actually more forty five thousand years of compute time that we need uh, to achieve that sort of idealistic goal, and that's kind of the the big issue that we're running into. So so a little bit. Uh, Going into our workflow, it, it is basically a straightforward particle physics workflow. You know, you have generate, propagate, detector, and then filtering, which is kind of, you know, you generate your particles, you generate your interactions, you then propagate those particles and, and their effects on your detector. And then you simulate your electronics, and then you simulate your sort of baseline uh, physics analysis, or rather baseline um, filtering. And so it, it is a sort of fairly straightforward in the sense that, you know, um, these are sort of four steps that every, you know, LHC experiments do very similar steps. The issue is really that, you know, we have very few dedicated resources in that sense. Um, the LHC can say, you know, we have all our tier ones, we have our tier twos. The data is there, and we know where the data is, and therefore we can schedule, you know, sort of do this data where we're scheduling, saying, you know, this this data is sitting in Chicago, so this job ends up in Chicago. Uh, we don't have that. We don't have these sort of, you know, we don't have data storage spread across the world. We only have a single sort of dedicated data store in, in, at UW. And that means we have this lots of data movement around. We have all this time that we waste basically shuffling data from, you know, a site in Europe back to UW, back to Europe, and so so on and so forth. And that's that's just a lot of time that we waste in, in this case. And then also because we have this large energy range and we like to have as much fidelity as possible, we have sort of drastically different requirements for various pieces of our simulation. That means, you know, we could be simulating along uh, fairly easily if, if our, our energy range was tighter. But uh, because we have this large energy range, you know, they, they can be these individual events that blow up the requirements or have drastically different requirements, and that means we need to be a lot more intelligent about, you know, what we request and how, <clears throat> and what it, what in, in terms of resources we request and how much runtime there is and, and things like that. So there's sort of this very long tail in our distribution in terms of resources and runtime uh, that we need to be aware of. So. <clears throat> Now let's move on to sort of the, the, the recent history. So it's sort of today or uh, moving into the day. So we're now in sort of the discovery and precision measurement phase. Uh, we had our first discovery in, in 2013, but now, you know, the, the era of near real-time multi-messenger astrophysics is, is basically here. So in, in August of 2017, we had LIGO plus some electro, like some, some partners making a discovery. And then in September of 2017, we had a neutrino and our partners making a, a discovery. Uh, basically, you know, we observed the same, the same objects, um, objects rather, uh, in different, and with different messengers or different bands. So basically, you know, in LIGO, it was gravitational waves, and in this case, uh, gamma rays and some light emission. In neutrinos, it was also gamma rays plus neutrinos plus light emission for this two distinctive events. Um, 
<clears throat> they, a lot of this, you know, went into, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of intricacy in terms of uh, infrastructure that goes into this. Uh, the, the thing is, though, that, you know, we still have this sort of central date, central hub, hub and spoke model where, you know, there has a centralized data facility, which has an HTC cluster and has all the data warehouse and the data, uh, data center infrastructure. But then we also, on top of that, sort of have distributed resources that come that become more and more important. So, you know, the OSG, an expansion in European uh, resources to some of our partners. We're adding exceed resources, uh, but then also institutional resources. So basically what we're doing is we're saying, you know, if you have resources locally available, we can harvest them uh, for our sort of joint um, joint undertaking such as uh, you know data data reduction pipelines but then also uh, simulation pipelines so uh, so today sort of we have this global heterogeneous resource pool meaning you know out of from Madison out we, we submit jobs uh, to Europe to South America to the to the continental US and Japan uh, these these, these resources are typically shared and opportunistic. That means, you know, we don't necessarily own any of them. We, we either get allocations or our partners get allocations, and then we utilize them opportunistically. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we have this atypical resource, requ uh, resource requirement in software stack. We have accelerators uh, are one of our requirements. Then we have this broad, Research, uh, physics reach, that means we have various different, you know, input parameters, but then also input sources. So there's lots of different physics that we simulate. Um, our analysis software is produced in house just because of this. So we need, because we need to be this flexible in that, in that way. Um, so for example, the standard packages in particle physics. So I, I call out GM4, but there's others like Pythia etc don't support everything that we do or they just simply don't exist so for example gm4 doesn't go up to the energies that we need so it, it, it uh, so we need to sort of uh take care of that we also have these niche dependencies for example uh, in this case corsica which is an air shower simulator which you know is a big blob of fortran 77 uh that we run to simulate our backgrounds and then <clears throat> We also have this this detector uptime at you know now at the ninety nine percent level. That means we are uh, you know <clears throat> compared to let's say the LHC, which over the last you know decade or so of operations has had these long shutdowns. We have not had a shutdown that's longer than you know order hours in those eight eight to nine years. And then of course we are in this natural medium. That means you know compared to um, uh, usual detector, we can't, for example, take individual pieces of the detector and calibrate them. We, we are, are one of our main detection mediums is basically a, a natural medium. And then, of course, you know, with all of this came sort of these, these sort of very significant changes in terms of, uh, you know, requirements, accelerators for one, now multi-messenger astrophysics and the alerted that comes with it. And of course, the the, some of the precision science that you know I mentioned earlier. So how does this whole sort of uh, look from the outside, uh, or rather uh, below the metal? So basically, we separated out the workflow management from the job submission. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do was sort of have a, as lightweight design as possible. And then the only major difference between sites is a config file. You know, we, we tell people, you know, fill in this config file and just run it with this code, this command, and it, <clears throat> this command. And um, that kind of sort of reduced the, you know, the, the sort of burden on, on, the, on the users, but then also on the individual sites. So we generate this system because we saw, you know, we wanted to, to use the, the, the work that was done by the Condor team uh, you know, to avoid performance issues. So before with our separate system where we sort of had our own scheduler and things like that, we had ex extraordinary performance issues where, you know, 
3,500 jobs is kind of the maximum that we can that we could schedule concurrently and in terms of uh, in, in condo land that, that that is a pitiful number in, in many ways. So I mean, um, and using that power uh, of, of the development of condor to sort of avoid that problem. And then, um, you know, and then also taking away the sort of expert knowledge in terms of deployment, operation, monitoring, sort of simplifying the infrastructure so that individual users had a much more, how should I put this, sort of a known interface or used to interface rather than, you know, this sort of uh, rather than sort of an obscure in-house developed interface to the, to the three resources. Um, so how does this actually work? Sort of this is completely borrowed from the OSG architecture. So this goes very much back to what the Condor team has been working on. So we basically just expose the resource requirements in terms of CPU, memory disk, and GPU via an HTTP framework. We have a remote client that queries that that endpoint, that HTTP endpoint, and says, you know, do you have any work for me? If yes, it will submit a start D job. It will submit, you know, a generic a Condor job, or rather, it will submit a job that will start a Condor job internally. Uh, that then connects back to a global pool. So that means basically we can have this sort of, um, you know global pool, but based on Condor in some ways. So this is much more simplified than the OSG infrastructure, but for us, it, it has been very successful just from a sort of uh, maintenance perspective. This means that, you know, we have a little bit of the, of multiple jobs are being submitted uh, with the same requirements, or it's sort of multiple jobs are being, so a single job is being spread out into multiple jobs across the pool. But ultimately, you know, with, with, with things like partitionable slots and things like that, we believe that, you know, uh, other jobs will be able to fit into those slots and then we can, you know, sort of harness that, those, those, or rather harvest those, um, uh, those resources without much of a, a, you know, overhead or rather waste in that, in this case. So from, so sort of from the from the user perspective, this is just an HD Condor pool, and they have to do the data management. That means you know it, we already had an HD Condor pool locally; it had a local file system. But in general, you know, modulo the data management, it looks the same as our Condor pool. From an operator perspective, it's it's very little overhead to add a cluster to the pool. It basically means you know. You can run a Condor status, and it will tell you if your site is in the pool or not, and and that's fairly straightforward. There's no need for a CE in this case, so this is the OSG compute unit. We can just use SSH or cron job for submission uh, because we just use HTTP to sort of uh, publish the information, and then we have the local container support basically saying, you know, some we, we've experienced this where various sites have different container models. So for example, at NERSC, we have a shifter versus attack. We have things like, um, you know, singularity, and we need to sort of accommodate that in, in some way. And, and it's fairly straightforward at this point. Um, one issue, of course, is, you know, this has come in sort of an organic growth at this point. So we have individual users adding sort of bits and pieces for their respective uh, sites. Uh, and that has caused some uh, some sort of need for some code cleanup, but then also we need to be more uh, aware of users and their needs for uh, containers. So we need to be able to introduce this need for uh, local containers or user containers rather into the into the uh, submit system. So from a workflow management point of view, we have something called IceProd, which is developed in house. This is mostly because of our energy range, but then also because uh, <clears throat> uh, we found that most of the other solutions uh, out there were either dependent on, you know, having a CE in, in, in terms of a compute unit in terms of, you know, accessing sites, but then also did not accommodate some of these um, multiple, you know, these steps of saying, you know, I, you need to move this data from A to B because A doesn't have a GPU. It just didn't support that. So we needed to 
sort of we couldn't paper over it, so we had to create our own system. <clears throat> uh, so, so for, for the first order, you know, it's a data provenance system and a data management system. That means that you know it can tell us where something ran, what version, uh, and if it was successful. And similarly, you know, data set management in terms of you know. In what is the what is the job status? What are the, the requirements of this job? Retries when when a job fails, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and just you know generally a monitoring infrastructure. So we use it currently for simulation production. So we produce our, our Monte Carlo data sets, and then of course uh, data processing here in the northern hemisphere. So to sort of give some context now in terms of multi multi method astrophysics. So what what we do is uh, we have this term messenger, which is basically just a, uh, an, an emission of some sort from an astrophysical phenomenon. So in this case, in, in, in the most prominent ones are gravitational waves, neutrinos, and electromagnetic uh, emissions, so light. It's, it's one of NSF's Big Ten ideas. So this is on the Windows to the Universe uh, banner. And you can see sort of how this works. That you know, in in, in 2017, Ice Cube detected a, a, a single event from from this blazar, um, and then sent out uh, a notification to the community. And then following up, you know, several or uh, all of these other experiments followed up on that uh, on on this discovery. So we have Swift, we have Fermi, we have you know, magic and all these various other, uh, in this case, electromagnetic counterparts uh, that performed follow-up observations and then also just detected, had, had detections. So basically what it was, it was a flaring source, meaning it, it had a very short period or had a period of higher activity. Um, but, you know, to respond to this in a fast and, and sort of structured manner, we need to have significant cyber infrastructure behind this. So in terms of A, the data transfer, but then also sort of having fast uh, data processing. Just sort of as a, as, as a side note, so in, in terms of, you know, if we wanted an ice cube plus LIGO observation, so gravitational, gravitational waves and neutrinos, that would be a neutron star, neutron star merger. And uh, if you wanted to, let's say, you know, have a neutrino, neutrino, um, Observation, it would be a core collapse supernova. So ideally, you know, Ice Cube and Dune, uh, once it's online, would be sort of the partner observ observatories here. So, and this of course complicates our sort of data management. So, from 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 before, we now have now added a third uh, stream of data. We call the alert data. But then, you know, that has to be that data then has to be sent out to our partners. So in this case. Uh, I've highlighted, you know, gamma rays, X-rays, gravitational rays, and, and uh, thermal emission or optical partners. But it means that, you know, we have to utilize this fairly uh, low bandwidth transport, transport via iridium. So basically, we basically make a phone call for all intents and purposes uh, to uh, transfer our data to then publish that to the outside world. And then, of course, you know, to get more fidelity, we would have to wait anywhere from you know a day to a week, depending on you know how big the data is. Um, <clears throat> so, sort of taking this now a step back, so now this all this complicates our data management drastically. So now we have three different basically paths: our alert, a high priority data path, which also includes some detector operations data. You know, in case the detector goes, uh, has issues, you know, somebody from the north, some expert can, can intervene, uh, not use that often, but, you know, uh, it's something that we need to be aware of. Then we have basically our filtered data stream that I alluded to that, that is, you know, fits over a satellite, but um, it isn't the hot, uh, most of the, uh, it's basically filtered down. Then we have our raw data that has to come via ship. Uh, <clears throat> we still have the central data warehouse, uh, through which all of the data basically has to pass in terms of either us physically loading in the disks or us uh, or the, the data coming through the satellite has to, has to live somewhere at some point. Uh, at this point, you know, the, 
we use SFTP and Grid FTP for our for data transfer that where we're hoping that will change. SFTP is given by uh, U.S. polar programs, and Grid FTP is kind of sort of the the was sorry was the choice initially. Um, you know, we're working on new archival data management strategies. Uh, basically, in terms of saying, you know, do we actually need all of this data on spinning disk? Is there some way to do data tiering, to do object stores and things like that? Everything that sort of has become popular over the last five to ten years in terms of data management and, and how we can, uh, you know, address that and kind of first of all, be more modern, and second of all, be more resilient in terms of, you know, data archival, but then also data management uh, overall. So uh, coming back a little bit to the reconstruction of multi-messenger astrophysics, you know, we want uh, our, our most accurate and fastest directional reconstruction uh, to basically give our partners, you know, a, a sort of a chance at observing this, this uh, uh, doing follow-up observations. So what we do is we basically do a brute force scan across the sky. Meaning, you know, if you look at the sky, if you look at the sphere, which is basically the sky, you can parcel that out into uh, equal area pieces. This is something that they have done for 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 decades in in astronomy. And basically what we do is for each individual direction that we pick, we do a hypothesis test. Meaning basically we say, is this, what is the likelihood of this being the hypothesis? What is the likelihood of this being the hypo this direction being hypothesis? <clears throat> the, the advantage of this is, you know, we get a, basically get a map saying, you know, across the sky, this is the most likely spot and this is the error around that spot. So basically saying that, you know, given a direction, what is the probability it you know it's off by half a degree or a quarter degree in in either direction? One of the big one of the big big parts here is that for each of these tests, each of these tests is independent in terms of computation. That means you know for if, if we were to scan across the entire sky at highest fidelity, we could spread this out uh, <clears throat> across you know hundreds, thousands, or even millions of cores. Uh, pretty easy, pretty straightforwardly, um, as long as the infrastructure supports it. So this is more of an infrastructure issue than it is sort of a workload issue. <clears throat> so sort of giving a detail here. So what, what we do now is because we don't have these million cores available to us uh, sort of instantaneously, we sort of do a rough scan first, and then we sort of step through different resolutions to figure out, you know, what is the the hot spot in this case, uh, and what is the error around it. So you can see, you know, in the beginning we have very few pixels, and we do very few tests, and you get like sort of a, a very coarse understanding. And you went, go to a next uh, step here, and you see you get a better understanding uh, of where the uh, a hot spot is, and then you, of course, zoom in very closely onto that hot spot and do even finer scans at that point. So you can see, for example, even in this lower picture on the lower right, how the pixels, uh, as you get closer to the you know preferred location, the pixels get smaller and smaller uh, as you do that. So it, it's now let's look at the the workflow a little bit in detail. So so we're, we're cu currently we're doing sort of a master worker setup, where you have uh, on our local resources. So these are dedicated resources to us. Um, all the work requirements are the same. The master just makes a decision all about the next scan, and we communicate via zero MQ. And this is mostly you know it's easy to set up. It's easy to use. Uh, we have experience with using zero MQ and other applications. Uh, the issue is, of course, that zero MQ is kind of uh, has is sort of you know fire and forget. So distributing it across, let's say, the grid or or you know distributed resources becomes a lot harder, especially because we found that we have scaling issues in, in with zero MQ. There's there's firewall issues if we go to the if we go to the open science grid. But 
also that ultimately, if we go over 2,000 cores, um, zero and Q just can't keep up with, with how fast the turnover is. And then, you know, we, we, have to also, we also have to use a scheduler on top of that to just, you know, aggregate the resources. So currently, we use Condor for this. And one of the things is that, you know, <clears throat> that we have thought up as, you know, the cloud provides sort of this elasticity of saying, you know, I need a thousand cores right now, and you can get them. You can even get, you know, a million cores right now, uh, but you have to pay for it. The big, the, the, the two big issues here, of course, that, that come up is, you know, how do we distribute the data to these various instances and how, and the question about, you know, is this actually, how do we, how do we get these, these large number of cores fast in the cloud? So as, as, as some of you might know, there's all these restrictions that the cloud providers put on, on individual users. So for example, in, in AWS, you can only generate five VMs at any given time, or in Azure, you can only generate one VM, and this is all kind of to protect uh, their infrastructure, but then also to avoid you running up a bill that you can't pay. Um, uh, and so, uh, because we knew, and in, in our sort of um, <clears throat> coming to data movement part, now, so we knew zero MQ wouldn't scale to the to these um, to these sort of massive pools. So we we we're looking at currently RabbitMQ and Apache Pulsar as a as a sort of an uh, <clears throat> as an alternative to these. Uh, and now with containers and things like that, we we can now uh, avoid all the headaches that come with running sort of an esoteric piece of software. So in this case, RabbitMQ is 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 uh, written in Erlang. We have no Erlang experts locally. Uh, we have no experts in the Erlang VM called Beam. Uh, so we can in the cloud we can just deploy a container or in this case a, a pre-made VM that has everything in it, and we just connect to it, and we're, we're basically uh, we're basically done in, in in this case in terms of infrastructure. We found that you know we can easily scale to up to five thousand cores. We we have done larger pools now. I'll, I'll hint at that uh, next. So for example, but the issue really comes down to at this point, if you want to do a single cloud zone and a single cloud provider, you are basically limited to roughly five thousand um, instances. That that is their upper limit that they will do that they will give you without significant social engineering, basically knowing somebody inside the organization to sort of, you know, tell them this is okay. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, as we heard, you know, from, from, from Frank and Igor, you know, to do this large scaling, so over 5,000 cores or 5,000 instances rather, you need to go to a multi-zone, multi-core, uh, uh, layer. So there's an so you need an orch orchestration layer uh, to reduce the transfer core. Uh, but then there's also still these sort of questions that linger. You know, what instances to use, or which multi-core instances are better for your application, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are they available in the zone that you're looking at? It's it. So there's a lot of open question in terms of you know, you know, fast quick scaling in the cloud um, that we still need to answer. Uh, so coming back, so as part of the, the thing that, that Igor, uh, that we did with Igor and Frank, uh, we actually found, you know, that, you know, we can scale to 80,000 cores in three clouds in 28 zones in 20 minutes. That means, you know, we can scale to these massive large pools that we only need, you know, for 20 minutes or, or 30 minutes, but we have to go in a in a we have to do this in a in a multi-cloud, multi-zone deployment. Meaning, you know, we still need an orchestration layer. In this case, Condor, or you know, uh, we still need some kind of pool management software to be able to to accommodate all of this. <clears throat> so again, but. We couldn't do this without, you know, this eager award or even the ECAS award through Internet 2. Sorry, I forgot about that. That basically all this testing is, is, 
and all these sort of questions that we need to answer that that are fairly that seem fairly rudimentary but sort of come are at the crux of some of these uh, at the crux of the scaling exercises uh, <clears throat> and then and then sort of you know how do we use them for these bursts these bursty things that you know as LIGO turns up but then also LSST will come online hopefully in the next couple of years will this this sort of resource need will will become apparent so let, let's let's look briefly at tomorrow um so we're, we're expanding the detector and steps so and we have an, what we call the upgraded proof which basically gives us a, a, a uh, infill, I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Uh, we will still have a central data fa analysis facility. So, but, but central is in quotation marks here because it will evolve in, in, in my eyes, at least. So, you know, we still have an HTC cluster, but, you know, it will be, it will be moving towards sort of a machine learning artificial intelligence platform, you know, meaning that there is, uh, you know, much more quote unquote interactive Thing that you know, a student comes in, needs something like a Jupyter Hub, a Jupyter Notebook that runs on a GPU node, and then they start training their models and tuning and, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is a much more sort of hands-on uh, experience to first order than you know today's work where they do you know cut and count, where they have cuts and they develop cuts, and then they run it through the data and see the effects and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But rather, this is much more about you know having sort of a, a, tin, a, a sort of a more interactive uh, experience with the data. Um, then we also want to move away from this sort of single tier model in, in terms of data warehouse to sort of a tiered model where you know we want to focus on a uh, the the machine learning artificial intelligence uh, applications need fast storage to be sort of fed. Um, there's a question about do we need, actually need to keep all this stuff spinning on disk is like if nobody touches it why spend the money on the hard drives but also the power and the cooling for it if we can just shove it off the tape and get it back within a reasonable amount of time uh, but then also kind of the uh, uh, sort of you know focus a little bit more in that sense focus on the important data rather than you know all the stuff that we have that no has that that might not be touched i mean we have to have an understanding of who touches the data what data is touched and then also uh you know what data is sort of cold in, in that sense and then of course the sort of a data set infrastructure we will still need some kind of wiki some kind of uh you know document server and things like that. But that will, I mean, we're, we're currently sort of in the transition period of saying, you know, why, why are we hosting things that somebody else hosts professionally? Meaning, for example, that, uh, you know, why would I host a Git server when there's GitHub and GitLab that I can use and they do this, you know, professionally, and they most likely do a better job than I do at hosting a Git server. And, and just things like that that you know we need to revisit and understand where you know where we can not just save money but also then save operator costs in, the, in that way and then of course you know with these uh with these lo massive large resources coming online so the exascale resources all all the exceed resources and the price resources we need to focus away from you know or I, I believe we need to sort of rethink a little bit this this thing about um, having um, uh, <clears throat> having a kind of uh, uh, sort of more focus on saying you know I can have four sites that are big and that I understand and I can you know with my current step current staff at my current staffing can handle or do I have 15 sites that are poorly managed and that you know drop in and out and I have no and I have no real control over them so that's sort of the uh, the the thought process here so it, it we will still have a distributed resources the question is though you know where do we put our support in terms of, of people and um, 
and things like that. So the upgrade now, so this is, uh, was approved last year. So this is a low energy extension that has a focus of, of calibration, neutrino oscillations and dark matter. So basically this says, you know, if we can improve our ice properties uh, or our knowledge of the ice in detail, we have a back catalog of, you know, 10 years of data that we can go through and improve. It is also uh, uh, an R&D for the next phase of IceCube, which is uh, IceCube Gen 2, which is currently in the conceptualization phase. This is basically a massive new neutrino astronomy facility at the South Pole. Basically, we're, we're increasing um, the detector volume by a factor of seven. The, I mean, the, these numbers aren't, aren't set in stone yet, but roughly seven. Um, there will be new detectors, uh, radio detectors, there will be new surface arrays, so this will be a, a massive new facility that we're proposing uh, in terms of, you know, with a focus, so Gen 2 will have a focus on the high energy piece here, so the, these are the EEV, PEV, EEV energies, so basically the cosmological scale uh, or cosmogenic neutrinos. Uh, then also comes sort of the, the machine learning infrastructure. You know, we, we have our first sort of couple results where people are, are, are relying on machine learning for their results. So this, 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 has nor, this has so far meant that there's a much more interactive environment in terms of training. So we started reaching out to the machine learning community to understand how to use, but also to extend machine learning for IceCube. So so first order ice cube is basically a three dimensional camera. So how do we apply, for example, standard, um, you know, image recognition algorithms to ice cube uh, in this sort of three dimensional world. And especially, you know, this, this brings um, changes in terms of, you know, the demand for GPUs and other accelerators. So in, in, in t including sort of things like TPUs, uh, to our users, so how they need to use them interactively. These are not necessarily "quote unquote" batch jobs at this point anymore, but rather sort of these interactive batch job, batch jobs, where the user actually needs some resource that might be far away, but they need to interact with it on a, on a fair on a, on, a, on a fairly sort of you know inter, fairly quick response fashion. And as I hinted on, this brings in this brings in changes in terms of storage. So um, the next slide, sort of data warehouse. So in, in moving sort of, you know, to this tiered model where we need to learn from the machine learning community and the LHC community in terms of, you know, in the, ML, in the machine learning community, the big thing right now is, you know, uh, NVMe on fiber and, and things like that, you know, where they need to feed the GPUs, the, the, the machine learning algorithms as fast as possible in some fashion. You know, typically this is somewhat POSIX compliant storage, but you know, this fast storage that, that you know, they have access to. But the LHC has shown us at the same time that you know, there is this data tiering model. You know, out of our data set, uh, like, just from experience, you know, mirroring their experience to ours, we know that, um, uh, that you know, not all our data is hot or all our data is being touched. We know there's portions that are completely untouched for you know years or, or months. Uh, they don't have to live on disk. They can live on tape. There's stuff that you know people might have lost interest in for a week or two and that can be moved off to, to a disk uh, rather than take up space on expensive flash storage. So things like that are, are something that we're thinking about right now. One of the big the big goals here is just to reduce the size of our POSIX pool. Uh, the po I mean, POSIX is, is all all fun, is all good for, for sort of small pools, small being around a petabyte, but large POSIX pools for outside of sort of an HPC facility are, are hard to manage in, in our experience. This is also kind of a reduction in cost um, thinking so in terms of you know tape per terabyte is a lot cheaper than disk is a lot and then disk is a lot cheaper than flash so keeping a, a massive you know 
10 petabyte disk storage, uh, how can we reduce the cost of that? And then also we want to have this ability to use modern technology. So object stores, HTTP data access and things like that, that, you know, come naturally with newer technologies like Ceph uh, and, and, and things like, you know, S3 compatible or S3 compliant uh, uh, storage offerings. So in terms of resources, uh, we will have more interactive workloads. There's more offline production. Uh, we will just have more, re more interactive workloads in general, more diversity in, 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 uh, in, in terms of, of workloads. Um, sort of we're looking for support right now from the large HPC centers and their related programs. So this is Praise, Exceed, Open, Open Science Grid are some of our, our, the folks that we're reaching out to. I mean, we already have a very strong relationship with the Open Science Grid and some of the Exceed sites, but now we need to sort of look into Europe and how, and how to, uh, in, in terms of Praise. And then of course, you know, with the exascale machines coming online, hopefully uh, coming online in the next year, year and a half, uh, or in two years, roughly, you know, we need to figure out how to use these machines. So kind of filling in the gaps uh, in these exascale machines to sort of harvest capacity. And that means, you know, all of these machines have GPUs in them. All of these machines or mo most of the U.S. machines will have, or all of the U.S. machines will have GPUs in them at this point. Um, and that, that is, helpful for us in terms of, you know, our workflow and our workflow and, and, and what, what our research requirements are. But at the same time, you know, these are very, you know, unique beasts in many ways. Each of them will be their own little world um, that we need to understand and then also sort of uh, be able to harvest the capacity out of. So sort of in, in closing, um, so IceCube has a global heterogeneous resource pool that's managed by sort of established and in-house developed tools. So this is Condor and sort of our, our uh, in-house developed stuff. We have lots of experience in terms of grid computing, but then also in Accelerate, how to deploy and use accelerators. Uh, so with, with, with our, um, you know, we have many changes and challenges coming ahead. ahead. Uh, so basically in terms of, you know, we want to move away from sort of this monolithic uh, single tier data system, single one-stop shop model uh, to a more sort of distributed model uh, and also of course make efficiency gains. We have sort of a changing mission at this point or a rather ever evolving mission that we need to address in terms of cyber infrastructure as well. Um, and then of course, you know, we have upgrades coming. We have this sort of the revel, the, the the sort of machine learning as a, uh, is becoming more and more popular in at least in our community. I mean, in others, it's already sort of the machine learning has already, you know, revolutionized uh, their findings, but in our community, it's not that broad yet. And then of course, you know, multi-messenger astrophysics with its burstiness, but then also in its follow-up, you know, will drive our requirements over the long run in, in that sense. So that's it for my site for now. <laughs> so, Benedict, thank you. This is a great talk. Um, you know, we're a little bit over, but there's still many of us still on the call. So were there any questions before we call it a day? I, I had one question was, Benedict, you talked about the reliance on satellite and the amount of time it takes for data migration and data movement to happen. I know it seems a little bit of, of an extreme possibility, but is there anybody talking about fiber optic cabling to the South Pole? Is that even remotely possible? No. <laughs> so, uh, so, so it's not possible just because, so, so what happens is basically you would have to drag a fiber over a glacier that's constantly moving at different rates at different spots. So basically the, it would just shear within, you know, a month. <laughs> Um, so there are new, so, so with CMBS4 coming in, hopefully sometime around 2024 or 2025, um, uh, DOE has a very strong interest in figuring out, uh, 
the data transfer needs. So there's something called Iridium Next, and there's a mil there's some older military satellites that could provide 24-hour sort of uh, gigabyte a second coverage. It's just a question of cost at this point. So will NSF be able to pay for that uh, service? And that's an unknown at this point. Thanks. Benedict, any, any other questions? Um, I, I just want to thank you for the talk. This was amazingly uh, informative and fascinating. And would you be willing to share your slides and I can share them with the rest of the group? Sure. Should I just email them to you? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. I've got one there was a question. Go ahead, Matt. Um, when you had the workflow uh, with all the data running through UW, the starting workflow, was that with the reduced data you were getting from the satellite, or was that from data, uh, full data you'd gotten off of disk or tape at some point? Uh, so it's, it's a mix. So there's a, a, the data workflow starts out basically either that we, gen that we basically have an input to some particle generator and it gives us some output, or um, some, or then stuff that comes from disk or tape in terms of, you know, this is data from, from the South Pole, it ends up at UW and then gets processed on. Okay, thanks. So it's, uh, it's Alan Silla. I had a question for Benedict. Um, it's interesting to see um, um, moving from just grid to grid plus other options categorized as shifting from one-stop shop to distributed computing. We thought we were building distributed computing. <laughs> but um, I am concerned about um, some of the points that you raised regarding cost. What, what uh, mechanism for assessment of cost will be put in place before uh, plunging into um, investments necessary to uh, shift the cyber infrastructure? So there, there's a couple things. Um, uh, that we that we take into consideration. So a big one, of course, is is for us is in kind contributions. So for example, right now, we have an agreement with NERSC to, to host uh, some frac or rather all of our raw data on their tape system. So if um, if you know if that trend continues, then we can say you know okay, this is our tape endpoint at this point and we shift all mo or the cold data over there so that that is the reduction in costs in sense that you know once the once we need to get rid of our or once our luster has is end of life and we have to replace it we just buy less or we replace we, we just spend you know instead of 10 instead of buying 12 petabytes I, we buy five petabytes because the other seven are sitting uh, for free somewhere uh, somewhere else. Um, the, the other big piece is for us at least is, is that, you know, um, this, let me put it this way. A lot of our stuff that we've done over the last 15 years is very much has a lot of technical debt or choices that were made 15 years ago when, you know, OSG wasn't really that big when um, Exceed wasn't really that, you know, how should I say, friendly to, to distributed computing um, and things like that. So, I mean, we, we need to have, it's always a sort of balancing act for me in, in terms of, you know, where to invest. Uh, and, you know, our biggest expense at this point is, is storage, um, you know, keeping up with the storage and keeping up with the data. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that, you know, we run power, we get free power and cooling um, makes it easy for us to run every single CPU into the ground. Um, and then also, you know, the availability of sort of free cycles from, from OSG or from partners uh, makes it hard for me to, to justify, you know, buying more CPU. It, it just, it just doesn't make any, any sense to first order uh, outside of, you know, a fairly small pool, uh, if that makes sense. 
or I'm just know, I was more concerned about, you know, the the experiments done by Frank and Igor have been, you know, very eliminating and uh, and have explicitly included the factor of cost. But um, to be in a little bit more detail about my concern, in reviewing um, the experience of NIH in making wholesale changes to convert their researchers to cloud, largely for data sharing reasons. Um, we found that the costs are astronomically higher um, uh, than, so, than expected, uh, and largely because uh, NIH folks are not sophisticated and end up hiring professional, um, re required hire, required to hire professional engineers from the cloud providers, Google, Amazon, Azure, and those so, drive costs way up. So I, I honestly, I have to say that you know. Using OSG doesn't come for free. <laughs> there has to be, right. Right. A, and and even building something on top of of Exceed or OSG also doesn't come for free. There also has to be a, a as you said, a professional there. Um, no, I completely agree, and that's it's, exactly it's, in that direction that we're trying. Yeah. To so so it. so the so the issue that I see is at least uh, this is a more this is now inside baseball, in some ways is that you know funding agencies haven't or at least the NSF hasn't realized that you know they're in this game now where professionals that you can't have a grad student come in write this code and then leave in five three to five years um, there's there's some sustainability that the, the, the sustainability aspect of this is, has a sort of not gotten through their heads and in terms of that I would say, you know, from from a, from a pure cost perspective, I rather hire another person to figure out, you know, OSG, than to figure out the cloud for me, because a, um, I the cloud providers are are to the first order, you know, they're 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 sophisticated drug dealers. I mean, the first hit is free, and after that, they they will they want their money. <laughs> Uh, and to second order, I think, you know, the, the universities make investments, NSF makes investments, DOE makes investments into computing. And as long as you can, uh, as, as, and, and those investments are, have already been, min, been made, so having the person, rather than working on cloud resources, work on, you know, getting your stuff working on, let's say, Aurora, um, is, is a much better, bang for the buck in, in that term because uh, it's just at that point you know you're you're you, you're not spending on the compute and the person but rather you're just spending on the person <laughs> yeah I, I take a slightly more neutral stance but I, <laughs> I think you've identified the issue that uh, that this um, layer of support is needed regardless of the of the um, delivery model and um, and that uh, it should be evaluated and uh, and fully costed. And beyond that, I think it's important to uh, to make one-on-one uh, -on -one assessments of cost. I mean, the, the the big the big thing for us is just, I mean, in terms of of resources, is that you know, at a university right now, as I as it stands, I don't pay for power and cooling. If I were to pay for power and cooling, the cloud is is where I go. And and that's the the big cost driver at this point. It's it's about fifty percent of the cost if I were to do all the math. Uh, yeah, the modern equipment it's about um, half the cost of the hardware over its lifetime. But it is true that older hardware it's more one to one. Thanks so yeah. much. I think you're no on problem. the right track. Yeah, interesting conversation that I'm sure we could go <laughs> spend another hour <laughs> on easily. Um, so. Yeah, thanks, Benedict. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Alan. Great questions. Thanks for all the other questions. And are there any last words? Okay, well, I will get this recording up on YouTube and send that out for the folks who had to go to their next meetings. And I'll see the rest of you in about a month. Thanks. Thanks again, Benedict. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.